kid, I loved monster movies, uh -huh. and I subscribed to Famous Monsters magazine. And in the back of that magazine, they always had little ads with Charles Darwin's photograph for Venus flytraps. And I already had a whole house full of lizards and snakes and turtles. And I convinced my mom we could afford another mouth to feed, and we ordered the flytraps, which was the month of December, and they were dormant, and they promptly died on me. What do you think other people see in some of the same things? Is there any of the things that pop up that occur over and over that people are interested in? Their everything? beauty. Mm -hmm. The fact that they eat insects becomes rather secondary. Yeah. Um, that may be what initially gets them into it, but uh, once they start growing them and find out how easy they are, how beautiful they are and interesting, and of course they don't just sit there, they become addicted. They breathe the drugged fumes that the plants give off a little too deeply, I think. <laughs> <laughs> What's overall the favorite ones most often people walk out the door with? Well, of course, Venus flytraps. They're still the number one king of carnivorous plants. And after that, I would have to say the American pitcher plants, mm -hmm. which are so easy to grow in most of the United mm -hmm. States. Um, and then sundews as well. Sundews are probably the most evil kind of a carnivorous plant since they look like they're out of a horror movie with those tentacles that wrap around their victims. We had uh, some aphids attacking some of our plants. Um, ironically, carnivorous plants are not immune to typical pests like aphids and mealybug and scale. Uh, if they ate all of those, we'd be millionaires, of course. But anyway, we, uh, at the old greenhouse, um, we released about 10,000 ladybugs in the hope that they would eat the aphids. And unfortunately, within about a day's time, virtually all the ladybugs were devoured by our plants. We watched them crawling over the aphids as they were drinking the nectar of the pitcher plants and they were getting stuck on the sundews. And uh, the next day, a little group of African Violet Society ladies came by, and they were so horrified <laughs> at seeing the pitcher plants filled with ladybugs and ladybugs stuck on all the sundews. Uh, they literally fled the greenhouse. They, they just walked out and left because they thought, you know, of course, ladybugs are our friends. So. Right. I like the. Are they called butterworts? Well, oh, most Mexico. butterworts are from Mexico. Okay. Yeah. Well, they're exquisite. <laughs> yeah, and that's the kind of plant that people mostly grow for their flowers. Uh -huh. And it appeals to all kinds of people, but a lot of, you know, little old ladies love to have, you know, butterworts on their windowsill. Uh, it helps to catch little fungus gnats and stuff yeah. that may be infesting their African violets. Yes, that's a could, we, could we look at the amorphous flowers? Yeah, it's in the hot house. We're looking for David. Well, this is a Morphophallus titanum. This one's about five or six years old from seed. When I got it, it was only in about a pot about that big, and that was about three years ago, or three leaves ago, I'm sorry, three leaves ago. And this leaf just started growing about, well, probably about 10 days ago, something like that. And this is a stake that I was measuring uh, earlier on, how tall it was. And this was one evening, the next morning, evening, the next morning, and then I didn't do it for a day, and so that was 24 hours of growth just there. It's actually a giant bulb down in there. It's endemic to Borneo. It was discovered by Bakari, who was a famous naturalist of that area. The giant tuber that he found was about 200 pounds, they say, oh, wow. and he had native porters uh, carrying it on sticks, you know, in a strut harness thing. They got tired and dropped it down for a second, and it nicked a rock. And uh, the whole thing just turned to mush on them before they, it, you know, before they could even oh. get out of the jungle. But uh, this one's probably got a tuber on it about this big or so, you know. And by the time it, just before it blooms, which should be about two or three years, the leaf will be pressed right up against the top there. I'm a little bit worried about the height, actually. Uh -huh. I think we might have to build some sort of a 
pinnacle or right up there, <laughs> give it a little extra space. Because they should get, the leaf should get about 14 feet tall, and it'll spread out to be an amazing, huge umbrella of a leaf. It's just... It really looks like something from another plant on us, which is really the plants that we like, so that's why we keep it here. <laughs> Here's a silly question. When the movie Avatar came out, did more people come into this place? A little bit, and there's a funny saying that's been born out of that, is people will come in and they'll, go, they'll look at one of my bog gardens and they'll be like, oh, look, it's like a little Avatar world, you know? <laughs> and, and so, and it's true, you know, my favorite thing is building bog gardens, mm -hmm. and it looks like, you, you know, you just want to shrink down and dance through the little sundew. <laughs> Except it's very dangerous, you know. <laughs> well, yeah, you were the size of the sun. Yeah, right? exactly, exactly. I was asking this, and Peter asked you too, whether you found people who want to design gardens, whether it's their own or somebody else's garden, are they getting more interested in these plants? Well, they're a tricky plant to landscape yeah. with, really, because they can't, uh, carnivorous plants can't go into the ground. Right. You have to prepare what we call bog gardens with a lined uh, pond liner to give some sort of uh, barrier between the native soil and the regular right. soil. Uh -huh. And then uh, once you get that in, you have to use only purified water or distilled water, so you have to have a lot of that on hand. We are, you know, we built my uh, big bog garden out there in the entryway to the nursery, and eventually I'm hoping that will inspire more people to uh, ask for bog gardens of their own. We estimate there's only about 5% left of the carnivorous plants that once originally were here in the United States. Only 5%, yeah. And like I was telling you earlier, a lot of sites are kept secret because when new sites are discovered, uh -huh. unfortunately, unethical growers and poachers will very often uh, just move into the site and dig up every single plant. And oh, so yeah, yeah. sites are still being destroyed. Like, well, your favorite mushroom spot, orchids, orchids, cycads. Exactly. Yeah. It's wonderful to share, but some places have to stay secret, yeah, unfortunately. After years of arranging these and growing and everything, do you have some things that are favorites that you use when you're putting your, your arrangements together? Whatever one I'm looking at, and that's the truth. Oh, wow. The simplest round leaf sundew that I first saw in New Jersey, the one that Charles Darwin wrote about in his book, Insectivorous Plants, it mesmerizes me as much as the most elaborate Nepenthe pitcher plant. Mm.